Good evening, and welcome to the first of the B-side lectures. Tonight, the lecture is entitled Hashtag Environmental Movement So White, and we'll be examining the environmental area, uh, environmental movement and its lack of inclusion in an area which everyone agrees requires us all to be engaged. We'll begin with a presentation by Alas Mashtahed Najafi, and we will then be joined in conversation by, by Leah Achampong, Senior Policy Officer in Climate Finance for the European Network on Debt and Development, and the Kenyan environmentalist, climate activist, and founder of the Green Generation Initiative, Elizabeth Watuti. Alas Najafi, Alas Mojtahed Najafi works on the external dimension of climate change in the European Parliament. She takes special interest in applying a human rights based approach to climate change through an intersectional perspective and the connections between racial justice, the environment, and climate change. Prior to joining the European Parliament, she worked at the Heinrich Boll. Foundation, a political foundation affiliated with the German Green Party. Alas holds an MA in Human Rights from Université Saint-Louis in Brussels and an LLM in European Law from Leiden University. Please help me welcome Alas Moshtahed Najafi. <laughs> Thank you, Dori. I am very happy to be part of this panel and to be able to share some of my thoughts. I would like to start out by actually the premise of my lecture, which is that we have to be very conscious of the fact that today's environmental and climate, that the global discourse on today's environmental and climate movement is firmly anchored in the racialized frames that all of us have to navigate every day. This is not the conclusion that I will draw at the end of my somewhat 15 minute talk. This is something that has to be understood from the very beginning. We have to go straight to the root of the problem and not only look at its condition. This means that structural disadvantages Discrimination and exclusionary mechanisms are as prevalent in the environmental and climate movement as they are anywhere else. At its very core, both climate change and environmental racism are stories of racial inequality that grow out from the same evil root. Having said that, there are two examples that I would like to give tonight that show how the environmental and climate movement is perpetuating these harmful patterns and how the media is playing a part in all of this. All right, so let us start by looking into one of the constitutive factors of today's environmental and climate movement. I think that it's fair to assume that we have all heard the warnings about climate change and environmental degradation. It is an existential challenge of never seen dimensions we hear, the greatest threat to our planet and a man-made catastrophe that threatens entire species and even the survival of humankind. Unsurprisingly, this sense of urgency is one of the main drivers of today's movement. So if our planet is literally burning and all our lives are on the line, why is it then that racialized folks seemingly stay at home? Indeed, the image of our planet in flames, it does sound scary, but a missing sense of urgency does not explain why racialized folks apparently do not engage with the climate movement. 
We hear that the world is about to end, but if we really start to think about the notion of an ending world, we must realize that a lot of worlds have already ended and continue to do so. In the face of neo-colonialism, structural racism and police brutality that affect the very lives, existence and livelihoods of racialized people, a distant doomsday suddenly does not appear so threatening any longer. Why invest time and energy if resources can be allocated to more pressing questions, such as today's well-being, and how to actually survive a system that is geared to reproduce white privilege and supremacy? Thinking about the future, if you think about it like this, is something only the ones that are not too preoccupied with the present can afford themselves. Rosamund Adukisi Debra, whose nine-year-old daughter Ella passed away due to the excessive levels of air pollution she was exposed to living next to a busy road in London, recently testified at the UN Working Group of Experts of People of African Descent, I quote, when my daughter was alive, my life was about teaching and going to the hospital. You would have never had me on something like this. People that we need to hear from, we can't, because they are very busy with their lives. If you have a child who is dying, you don't have time to come onto these panels. Thanks to her mother's tireless activism, Ella is now the first person in the UK or even the world to have air pollution listed as a cause of death. Jefferson Estella, a 20-year-old Filipino climate activist, puts it like this, I quote, white activists can protest whenever they want because they have homes, jobs, a huge amount of freedom, a huge amount of freedom of expression. Believe me, we want to do big things, but what's stopping us? A future and a life that is at risk. Indeed, nowhere else in the world as in the Philippines, as many environmental land defenders have been killed, or Colombia for that matter. The NGO Global Witness found 40% of killed environmental land defenders in 2019 were actually indigenous <clears throat> were actually indigenous people. <clears throat> These killings are part of a broader global trend, and they are just the most extreme form of intimidation. Countless more activists are being silenced by violent attacks, lawsuits, arrests, or death threats. And the result of this silencing, it is a wide-led narrative that excludes the perspectives of color. Without their voices and realities, the fight of our planet turns into a single issue struggle. Yet what we desperately need is to place racialized perspectives, perspectives at the forefront. Otherwise, we will remain stuck with a narrative that does not match with the multiple issue lives of racialized folks. Think about the mother of Ella and the land defenders risking their lives. Their doomsday has already come, and it is not just them. In some parts of the world, we see already the brutal realities of a changing climate. In East and Central Africa, millions of people are in need of humanitarian aid as climate extremes have caused widespread food shortages, threatening food security and livelihoods. We talk about future climate-related conflicts, but this is happening already in Darfur, the, first, the world's first ever climate change conflict. Think about, small, think about small developing states such as Tuvalu, where sea rise and coastal erosion turn them from developing into disappearing states. All these lives, 
already lost, and all these lives continuously in danger. But even in death, the mechanisms of racism make sure that the lives of racialized persons do not matter. They do not matter because already alive, they were deprived of value. Ella's death showed me how brutal life can be, her mother said in her testimony. In the death of this innocent little girl, we see an extreme manifestation of disregard towards racialized people. In a context where people are dying, the question arises, <clears throat> the question arises, how we as a society deal with these vanished lives. The philosopher Judith Butler asks the questions, whose lives, whose life appear as a life? And whose loss would register as a loss? And goes on to ask, what makes for a grievable life? In a world where our understanding of humanity is deeply racialized, there unavoidably are some lives that are deemed more grievable and valuable than others. Despite these obvious facts, white people remain at the top of the narrative. A recent poll in the UK found that twice as many British adults think that white people across the, across the world are the most vulnerable ethnic group to the negative impacts of climate, of climate change. In this distorted perception, white lives are in most need of, per, of protection. Tell that, to, tell that to the people of Tuvalu, whose home is literally disappearing and where people suffer from climate-related illnesses. This unfounded anxiety might connect to a wish to preserve the world as we know it, with all the privileges that it holds for white people. Yet if we were to ask environmentalists of color, they would quickly link their activism to questions of social justice and class. They would point to avenues for change because they know that the world as we know it has caused the mess that we are in. They would point us to similarities that we observe across the globe, similarities that are linked to the historical construction of race that fuels an extractive, extractive capitalism without any regard for lives, resources, land, and health. It is exactly this kind of connection that single issue struggles with their focus on a doomsday narrative lack. If we go on to look into harmful environmental impact, we quickly realize that racialized communities bear a disproportionate share. They find themselves closer to industrial zones and it's in their backyards that hazardous infrastructure is being placed. This is linked to historical and structural racism that tie these communities into marginalization and poverty. And on a global scale, this trend reproduces itself. Every year, tons of hazardous waste are being shipped to the global north, to the global south from the north. The creation of such racial unequally environments does not necessi necessitate for white people to be fervent racists. No one wants to have incinerators and landfills in their backyard. But in a racialized society, the natural instinct of white people reproduces racial inequality. As I said in the beginning, structural disadvantages Discrimination and exclusionary mechanism also happen in the environmental sphere. And when one group of people has the resources to fight off harmful infrastructure, someone else's backyard will have to suffer. 
This doomsday narrative might be one of the causes that white people are more prone to become engaged. Another reason is the strategies that the movement puts in place. If we have a closer look, we see that the strategies are all characterized by some form of insubordination or transgression of rules. At least these are the actions that get the most attention. We see students refusing to go to school, risky maneuvers from skyscrapers or occupation of forests, blockage of streets and bridges, and last but not least, disruption through mass arrest. These strategies pay off. We all have seen the pictures of protesters being carried away by the police, by students refusing to go to school, and by people hanging from buildings so high that you get dizzy by only looking at them. What all these forms of protest have in common is that in one way or the other, they unavoidably lead to a conflict with the, with the authorities. They all share the common trait of transgressing rules or in subordination. One of the most publicized groups these days is Extinction Rebellion. The group deliberately uses disruptive tactics by urging its members to get arrested. The police are informed in advance about all actions, so they can show up and play their part in a pre-orchestrated spectacle. These are then the images that make it to our social media and news feeds. Understandably, people are less prone to engage in such confrontational tactics when they have already experienced trauma at the hands of the police. They will certainly not participate in staged mass arrests when they have to fear for their residence statues. They will not participate if they do not trust the system and its agents to which they are expected to willfully deliver themselves to. They will not participate if they have to fear for their lives and their bodily integrity. Students are less likely to ditch classes when all they hear at home is that their parents made this and that sacrifice for them so that they could have a better life one day. And people will certainly not chain themselves to trees, railroads, or any other object for this matter if such action leads to encounters with the police and a judicial system they cannot trust. So consciously or unconsciously, racialized folks stay at home because these kinds of strategies are not designed in a way for them to engage in. <clears throat> but is it really true that people of color actually do not engage in the climate movement? A look beyond the white frames proves the narrative of a white-led climate movement immediately wrong. If I think about our magnificent panel, I already know that it's wrong. Yet what we see is only a certain form of activists, because when it's white, it's right. The same study that showed heightened levels of climate anxiety among white people found that black, Christian, black Christians in the UK are a very informed and engaged community, more so than their white counterparts. The wonderful Archdeacon of Croydon is only one proof among many to an actively engaged community leader of color. I am grateful to be part of this event today. Allow me to finish by saying that the context of this event, however, is representative of a recurring pattern. Racialized folks often get called upon to speak about diversity or the lack thereof. But they are not systematically sewn into the very setup of institutions. They are not involved at all stages in decision making and are not systematically consulted. Most shockingly, not even in cases where their lives are on the line. We still need to come together in events like this to remind the public that there are other voices out there that we matter and that our voices need to be heard. 
I am happy to come out of this help in any way, but I honestly think that this should not be necessary in the first place. Thank you for your attention, and I look very much forward to our discussion. Well, alas, thank you, first of all, for that really poignant and clear, resonant uh, presentation on the subject of um, the lack of diversity uh, and inclusion within the environmental movement. Um, I just first now want to introduce um, our two panelists that are uh, joining us in the discussion. Um, our first panelist, Leah Achimpong, is a senior policy and advocacy officer in climate finance at the European Network on Debt and Development. Leah joined Eurodad in April 2020 to start up their policy work and research on climate finance, which includes building network capacity to work on climate finance. Leah began working in climate change issues in 2011 on policy, advocacy, network coordination, and in communications and events. Prior to joining Eurodad, she worked at the WWF European Policy Office for over four years and has also worked at Climate Action Network Europe. Campaign Against Climate Change as well and the Environmental Investment Organization. Leah holds a master's degree in sustainability science and policy from Maastricht University and in 2017 participated in the US State Department's International Visitors Leadership Program. So welcome Leah. Uh, we look forward to talking with you in just a few moments. Our next panelist is Elizabeth Watuti. She is a passionate environmentalist and climate activist from Kenya, the founder of Green Generation Initiative and the head of campaigns and coordinator of Daima Coalition for the Protection of urban green spaces at the Wangari Maathai Foundation. She is a full member of the Greenbelt Movement, board member of the Elephant Neighbors Center, and a youth council member of the International Reserva, the Youth Trust. Due to her outstanding passion, leadership, and personal commitment to environmental conservation and societal issues, she received the Wangari Maathai Scholarship Award from the Greenbelt Movement, Kenya Community Development Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. Elizabeth holds a bachelor's degree in environmental studies and community development from Kenyatta University, was a regional finalist for Africa for the UN Young Champions of the Earth 2019 due to the impact that Green Generation Initiative has had. And while attending COP25 in Madrid, received the Young Climate Champion 2019 Award from the Green Climate Fund. So thank you both for joining us. Um, and, you know, just I'm very proud to be a part of this and I'm so grateful that you all have agreed to participate in this. I just first want to start out with a general question to um, Leah and to Elizabeth to talk with me about um, your reflections on what Alas had to say to us earlier um, and how it relates to the work that you do um, and your motivation for doing it. So please, let's start with Leah. Thank you, Dori, for uh, inviting me to uh, speak here today. Um, I very much found that what Alas had to say moving but it's unfortunately not something that is uh, 
uncommon and it is something that I see within the work that I do. Some of the points that I last was highlighting around uh, extractivism um, and the links to spatial inequality. So where you live in the world impacts your ability to access um, the, the same sort of resources and um, uh, strategies in order to address the, the climate impacts within that, that you are facing within your community. That is a real um, factor in terms of spatial uh, inequality. Um, and it, it also, the vulnerabilities that different communities face um, can be can be seen and reflected um, in the, the fundamentals of the structures put in place with, with regards to uh, development policy, development finance policy and climate finance uh, policies as well. Um, something that we, we see um, within uh, development finance approaches um, is this uh, trend towards using export driven approaches um, and by export driven, I mean um, that, for instance, the high consumption patterns of countries in the global north are impacting the, the macroeconomic uh, policies of countries in the global south. Um, meaning that uh, in, in some cases, um, uh, high consumption rates of, of countries in Europe are, are leading to countries in the global south choosing to make use of um, choosing choosing specific production, um, making specific production choices, uh, which are not suitable for workers or for their local environments, but they're doing so because they are aware that there is a, a comparative advantage of being able to be that, that country that provides that supply to that, that developed uh, or to that country Market, in the yeah. global north. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we see this uh, trend that is coming into the, the climate finance movement as well. And something that is fundamentally unfair um, is that a lot of the time um, we see that countries in the global north, their currencies are the ones that are most used for things like tradable assets. Um, and so a develop a, a country in the global south that is trying to um, uh, finance either its own um, sustainable development or climate finance activities um, is having to use the currencies of a country in, in the global north, which is hindering the ability for them to strengthen their own domestic currency and yeah. therefore their own domestic economies as well. Okay, thanks, Leah. You covered a lot of ground in that. And so um, we'll loop back um, on much of what uh, you brought up there and also because I'm really interested in talking, showing, uh, speaking with people about how the finance really sort of pushes forward a lot of the practices and choices that are being made in the global south with regard to the benefits that are uh, being read out in the global north. Um, Elizabeth, can you uh, give us some feedback on what you thought um, about what Alas had to say to us about the movement and how it impacts you and your work um, in Kenya, but also globally. Thank you so much for having me here today. And I do totally agree with uh, Alas on the movement right now. And just to highlight that it is true that climate change is disproportionately affecting people of color. And what I see for me is that we are placing the greatest burdens upon those who have the least capacity to adapt and the least number of resources to fight it. And we cannot continue to erase that from the conversation because the climate crisis is no longer a future concern for countries like mine in Africa. And while climate change may seem as a distant threat for people that are living outside of the global south, it does not mean that it's not happening. There are people that have to deal with the impacts each and every day. And of course, these impacts are escalating every time that we delay action. And I think it is time for the world to also recognize that the climate crisis is a social justice and racial equity issue too. And it is threatening lives, livelihoods, homes, 
as well as the health of the people and those who have the least capacity to adapt. And these are the people that have to bear the brand. And Africa, for instance, only contributes to about 5% of the global greenhouse gas emissions because it is severely impacted by the impacts at the end of the day. So it clearly shows that the people that contribute the least to the problem are the ones that have to deal with the impacts from the floods, the droughts, food insecurity, desert locust invasion, cyclones and heat waves. And also take a look at the unfolding debt and solvency crisis. Developing countries like Kenya are facing many crises right now with COVID-19 being the latest and governments already lacked the funds or are either borrowing in excess to adapt to the present and future climate impacts. But despite these problems, developing countries still find it hard to hold the developed countries accountable for the environmental actions. And maybe due to the said notion that later on we might seek support, maybe in terms of funding. And this is not right because it's definitely silencing developing countries. And even for me as a young climate activist from the global south, it is really always difficult to even find our voices, to have our voices heard out there in the global perspective and in the international platforms as well. Yeah, I think that's uh, really important to, to make clear and also the complexity of it in the fact that um, the, the, the financial aspect is actually what is impairing voices from the global south to find sp to take space within this discourse and ultimately it's it's um and I, I would like maybe now to have leah do a little bit more like technical orientation for us around uh climate finance because one of the things that i've learned from you over the last few months is the 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 way in which this piece of the puzzle is not very often discussed. So there's a lot of visibility around activism, like uh, Alas described as sort of transgressive or insubordinate uh, behavior with, um, uh, with different organizations and groups. But then the, the piece that's really defining the power relations in the discourse, finance, is, is rarely, if ever, um, put on the table. And so and I, I give you that piece to, to bring us up to speed on. And then also I want you to talk to me about uh, an issue that is really a bit troubling now in the climate finance um, area, which is this um, conversation that uh, Reverend Lennox Yearwood put forward um, with the industry now referring to um, sort of uh, polluting aspects of finance as brown finance. Could you um, have, give me some um, give me some information and focus our, our minds around what that uh, is, how that's impacting the movement and its ability to engage with communities within the global south and also what we refer to as the south in the north places like uh, Cancer Alley in, Los in Louisiana, Flint, Michigan, um, uh, Cro um, you know, the Ella, um, who we just discussed earlier, um, living in London. Yeah, um, I can certainly talk to those aspects, but I also wanted to say that I very much uh, agreed with what Elizabeth was saying about the impact that the, all of this is having on the voices of people who are most vulnerable to climate change, not being taken seriously enough or being even included within the, the debate itself. Um, uh, one of the, the biggest issues with the climate finance um, agenda is that there is a lack of country ownership of, of the climate finance agenda. This is um, in terms of, there are a lot of different climate 
action events that take place in a given year. And the, the climate action agenda means that every year culminates in a um, conference of the parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, and then there are subsequent meetings um, a ahead of that, of that conventions meeting at the end of the year. And something that you see throughout is that the agendas of these various different meetings and events are largely being driven by developed countries such as um, the UK and the USA. And that when the agenda isn't driven by the people who are most impacted by climate change, it means that the, the issues that are really important to them, such as ensuring that they have access to a predictable stream of climate finance are not being taken up. But also what we see is that there is a clear autonomy or um, divide between um, what climate finance there is and how that climate finance is, is actually being used. Um, mm -hmm. if, if you look at the, um, the, the climate action commitments that countries in the global south have submitted um, to, un, under the Paris Agreement, these are called nationally determined contributions. If you look at them, then what they what countries in the global south highlight within them is that there is a need for um, climate finance um, for, for adaptation, climate finance to address loss and damage issues, as well as climate finance for mitigation issues. However, overwhelmingly, what the statistics from uh, OECD, sorry, um, um, the Organization, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, there's their um, statistics and uh, um, climate finance tracking shows that overwhelmingly the finance is going towards mitigation. The reason for that is because the agenda is largely being driven by developed countries. Um, another issue is that when a, a, a UN um, framework convention on climate change at conference of the parties cop um in the last few years these um these forums are are the the one space where you have the ability for all all relevant stakeholders to be a part of the discussion on climate action um however whenever it comes to be the turn of a developing of a country in the global south um something something happens for for it to mean that the the session ends up being held in a um in a country in the global south so for instance cop 25 should have been held in chile instead it was held in spain um and this is due to um a lot of social social pushback from citizens around the, the unfair um, practices of, of the government at, at the time. And that is related to the, the social impacts as well as the environmental impacts that they are facing. The, the, the climate movement can't just be a movement focused on environmental issues. It also needs to be all encompassing of racial justice and social justice, justice for all communities. And so there is very much a need to ensure that these agendas are driven by those countries and communities who are most in need of this climate finance. But there also needs to be greater mechanisms put in place to ensure that these communities and countries have access to that finance. Um, because even within a country, there are a lot of inter and intra um, equity issues and there's the issue of spatial inequality that I was talking about as well. So by that, I mean urban environments versus rural environments and who is gaining access to that, to that finance. It's usually rural communities who need access to finance to address loss and damage. Loss and damage um, are the climate impacts that um, are so far gone that you're not able to adapt to them um, yet in a in an urban environment what they need uh, climate finance um, for is is largely going to be for mitigation um, activities so 
there's a need to do analysis of what the the inter and intra equity issues within a country could be, um, as well as to do gender analysis as well, in order to ensure that climate finance supports and empowers young women to be able to gain access to the same opportunities as young men have within a country as well. Um, yeah, I think I think that that is really um, a, a powerful clarification because I think in like I said earlier the disc the conversation rarely expresses in details for people why certain end prod end results happen at these uh, big meetings and why the reporting um, tends to be around countries in the global south not wanting to play in the same way um, as as um, global north countries. I just want to um, ask Elizabeth, given what um, Leah was talking about, I want you to kind of give us an opportunity to to hear from uh, a young African and a young activist in the global south and how you got started um, and involved in uh, climate activism and also um, how communities in the global south in Africa are devising their own solutions to crises that are being presented by climate change. Thank you so much. I was inspired by nature to be part of the environment and climate movement. And I grew up in the most forested region in Kenya. And my childhood was more of the trees that were ahead of me, the bushes, the clean streams and rivers that were flowing near my home, which explains to you that nature was still intact. And this is what inspired me and gave me the love and connection with the natural world. And in the process, I also felt heartbroken witnessing deforestation at first hand and witnessing people who have to suffer the worst impacts of climate change. And I would say that definitely nature has always been my best teacher. And in the process of really witnessing some of these challenges, I also got interested to understand more because I did not have access to the information about the complexities of the issues that I was witnessing. And that is when I also decided to read and also watch documentaries about the planet. And I think it is when I also ended up realizing that the problem was huge and it was beyond what I was seeing back in my home. It was about the wild forests that were being destroyed and being burned down at alarming rates. It was about the waterways around the world, like the lakes, the rivers and the oceans that were flowing with what I like to call a soup of poison flowing with plastic waste. And these things, made me feel devastated. And I would say that I have really had this connection with nature that also makes me feel the pain of nature in the process. And that is why I'm now fighting for nature regeneration and fighting to ensure that we make sure that all the remaining natural ecosystems stay intact. Because what hurts nature hurts me too. And I believe that if we continue to really interfere with the human ecological balance, then we are not being mindful about how we are going to leave this planet for the next generations. And it is also holding up progress when it comes to addressing the impacts of climate change. So I would say as a young climate activist from Africa, it is always sad to see the aspect of nature as well, not being really hugely brought out in the climate conversations because Africa's natural ecosystems still remain to be the most of them that have that are still intact up to date but yet they are the most threatened by the ongoing environmental degradation and yes we say that we are connected through nature and it is important to recognize this interconnectedness but we can never turn a blind eye to the injustices that happen in all of these issues around us because we may be in the same storm yes but we are definitely in different boats and I think it is time we begin to recognize these aspects and then begin to address the root causes of the problem. So for me, being able to be inspired by nature 
I realized that it was because of that love for nature at a young age that made me be conscious about how my actions every day end up interfering or rather positively or negatively impacting the planet. And that is why I also decided to nurture young people to be environmentally conscious at a young age, because access to awareness and education and information on the natural resources is what is going to also make people begin to appreciate and understand their value. So I started to nurture young people to have the same love for nature, which explains that I focus on changing the mindsets of the people about how we view this planet and also changing the mindsets of the young children by involving them hands on because it is beyond telling them about the science and the data of climate change. Most of them may never understand. It is about making them understand the issues from where they're coming from, from their villages, from their rural areas where they don't even have access to technology and then making them find solutions that can help them right from the local levels. And some of these solutions have been solutions like tree growing, where I ensure that every child in every school in my country gets an opportunity to plant and adopt a tree in their school compound. I personally had a chance to plant my first tree when I was only seven. And it is an experience I always recall up to date, which tells us that if we expose the young children regardless of where they're coming from, regardless of what they have access to, if we expose them to nature and remind them that they can be a part of the solution, then we can begin to make progress as a world. And the other aspect, we've also been focusing on changing the face of these uh, schools as well, because so many schools, I would say around my country, you find that there are challenges beyond how the surrounding is. It's beyond the fact that they don't have maybe access to uh, you know, the natural tree covers, for example. It is about the children that also have to go a day without a meal. And we find solutions for these children to address and tackle these challenges in a holistic manner where we focus on a tree growing aspect that also benefits them in terms of giving them a nutritious source of food for them. So we started to also establish food forests where we pick a designated corner in the school compound and then we plant mid species of fruit trees. And what this means is that it is going to help my country attain and, and surpass a 10% forest cover, which is the UN required minimum for every country. And my country is currently at 7.3%. And at the same time, provide a nutritious source of food for these children, and it's going to supplement the school's feeding program. So I look into changing the people's mindsets into as something that is going to be a great solution for the world and also not leaving anyone behind, regardless of their age, their race or wherever they are coming from. Because at the end of the day, this planet really calls for each and every person to be present in terms of the solution. And I also look at it in terms of individual responsibility and system change, because unless we empower our people and make them feel informed about the challenges that are happening to the world, then it's going to be difficult for us to begin finding solutions. And of course, being a climate activist from Africa and from the global south, you risk everything. It's overwhelming and it's also the aspect of the lack of results because we are taking these positive actions on the ground like I've mentioned. But on the other hand, the countries that are the most responsible for this challenge, we still do not see results happening we talk about the end of fossil fuels investments and uh, a start of nature regeneration investments. We talk about bringing down emissions, but where is the change? We are not seeing the change each and every day. It's like we keep coming back to the same conversation every other year. And of course, it really makes each and every person who has to go through the loss and damage from the climate crisis really uh, continue to face the worst impact at the end of the day. Because I would say, when we continue to delay action, we are continuing to fail the future generations and we are also failing the people that are every day facing the impacts of this crisis. Yeah, I mean, to carry from there, I mean, Elizabeth, why, why do you feel that the voices, particularly the expertise of local indigenous people um, has not been called in? I've considered that one of the most baseline elements as to why the climate movement is 
quite frankly, a bit questionable. I mean, indigenous people have maintained what we now consider quote unquote wilderness for centuries. They've been ex exquisite land managers, but somehow in this particular instance, their expertise no longer applies. And I, I just don't understand. We can, I mean, do you think that this is again, engaging with this whole extractive culture uh, historically uh, that we can see um, communities being asked to divulge certain uh, medicinal formulas and plant combinations or for foodstuffs, but when it comes down to the, the actual, you know, 365 degree notion of that kind of management, um, somehow the expertise of, of this group of humans is no longer relevant. I mean, I call it the faulty witness that people can be there in one aspect, but then when it's serving the global north, but when it comes to a much more comprehensive and much more beneficial for the indigenous or people on the ground, then it becomes, well, you know, your knowledge base is not actually adequate to deal with the complexities of this issue. I would say, and just like you have mentioned, the issue is really about the fact that we have just chosen to ignore the people that are really the most important in finding solutions for the challenges that we are talking about every day. And the priorities for these communities and people of color, for example, we all know that they are drastically different. And there are so many challenges that these people have to deal with every day. And we are not only fighting for representation, but also acknowledgement of the root causes of this problem and accountability from the people that are the most responsible for it. And I think at the end of the day, I would like to call it human greed as well, because if you look at the African continent, for example, why are we allowing the only continent that has its most intact natural resources to continue being the continent whose resources are the most degraded every day, even from foreign direct investments, and also the same continent whose people have to continue facing the impacts of the crisis, but we want to turn a blind eye and assume that maybe climate change is not happening. There is this notion from the world that because it's not happening where you are, then it's not happening at all. And it is really wrong because it doesn't mean that just because you don't feel it from where you are, it's not happening. It is only that the people that are the most vulnerable have not been given a voice and they deserve to have that voice. Because addressing the issues of climate change and the issues of environmental degradation without the people that are at the center of this crisis it means nothing at the end of the day. And that is why when we sit on these tables and discuss solutions, for example, about the climate crisis, and I think uh, Leah also mentioned about the conference of parties, these people are often misrepresented. They are not always on the table. So we sit there, talk about their challenges without them. And that is definitely talking about if we talk about them without them, then we are definitely doing these things against them and it is not right. So I think at the end of the day, it is about recognizing that these inequalities exist. And that is what is really shutting us away from not beginning to address the root causes. And the root cause of this is, there is no way that we are going to address climate crisis without addressing environmental justice, without addressing social justice, and without addressing racial justice. All of these issues are interconnected. And unless we begin to realize the complexities and the interconnectedness of these issues, then it's not going to be easy for us to address any of these challenges because we cannot address one at a time. We all have to address all of them at the same time and recognize how connected these issues are. And I think we are also seeing it right now, even when it comes to the access to vaccines of COVID-19, for example. And there's already a discussion that the conference of parties might be virtual. 
So what is going to happen to the communities that don't have access to this technology where they can even join these forums virtually? It does not make any sense at the end of the day. So I think it's about recognizing the complexities and connectedness of these issues. Then that is the only time that the world will begin to see a difference because if we continue turning a blind eye or assuming that these issues don't exist, then we are not going to be able to address them at the end of the day. I completely agree. And I think that this is one of the um, aspects of the, the movement and the, and the whole presentation of climate change to the world generally has left so many incredible gaps uh, for people to understand that I mean, everybody talks in these platitudes about, yes, we're all connected and blah, blah, blah. And we know that. I mean, we are humans and we do get that. But the reality of it is, is that some people are more connected than others, <laughs> right? And so uh, with that, you know, sort of aspect being very um, relative and the fact that the owners of the discourse, the people that are managing the discourse are actually consciously separating themselves from the people most impacted uh, by this phenomenon uh, you know is is a very problematic frame so uh, we we just have a few more minutes and then we have to go to the question and answer but i just wanted to ask each of you a general question uh, to close um what do you believe needs to be done to change this power imbalance within the environmental movement. Alas, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, sure, I can start. Unless you have a burning answer that you would like to get well, rid of each first. Each one will have their turn. All right. Um, I think um, I would like actually to um, answer this question by um, linking to the European level where we now are talking about the Green New Deal, which is um, in some, some, con some see the Green New Deal actually as a mechanism that can help us actually to tackle the, problem, the problems that we see these days. But in my understanding, actually, this will not be possible if we separate it with another important instrument that we have just seen, that has just seen the light of the day, which is uh, the EU anti-racism strategy. So we have these two new instruments on a European level, which just, and I have the impression that this is actually representative of a global trend, that we have these two conversations and they are led separately from one another. And I don't see that there is space actually to unite these two and allow themselves to create a new narrative that actually tackles exactly the root of the problem, which is, and I think we all here agree, mm. is racism. Racism mm. that fuels all the problem that we actually see and also which was at the beginning of the problems that we see today. Elizabeth talked about the uh, relationship that she has with the nature and the environment, which I found very beautiful. But exact, exactly this relationship actually, which was founded on racism, if we go back some centuries, is at the root of the problem that people actually thought, and when I say people, I mean white people, that they could actually put themselves on top of nature and use it. So we need to tackle, to sum up what I said, I think we need to tackle both together and try to create a new narrative that creates a new space to discuss. Okay, I really like that. Thank you for that. Leia, do you want to go next, please? Yeah, I think that it's um, fundamentally, in terms of policy, that it's about ensuring coherency between the different agendas at play here. So as Alas has said, um, at the EU level, you have the European Green Deal, and you also have EU um, racism strategies, but there's very much a need to align the various different agendas that are out there, whether it's at the EU level or the international level. At the moment, a lot of these agendas are follow different timelines and diff have different deliverables. Um, so for instance, you have the Paris Agreement, you have the Sustainable Development Goals, 
um, you have the the UN um, uh, Business and Human Rights Declaration, all of these different um, uh, policies have different timelines, different different deliverables and, and different structures in place. There needs to be some sort of fora that looks at all of these things in context and ensures that none of these different agenda points are undermining each other. Um, this week, Germany finally ratified um, the, the International Labour Organization's uh, Convention on Indigenous um, Communities and their rights. And this is, I think it's something like 20 years since that convention was put in place. Um, and now Germany needs to look at how to um, actually translate that into national um, uh, legislation. There's a need for all of the different relevant stakeholders to be at a table to understand how to ensure coherency across these different agendas. It's a difficult task, but I don't think that it makes sense to continue con to continuously develop different policy agendas and policy objectives if they're ultimately going to be either directly or inadvertently undermining each other. Oh, thank you for that. And that was really a good way to kind of um, tie into what Allah said, but also to kind of lead us forward and give us some clarity about the interconnectedness of these organizations, both in terms of the national and international uh, levels. Elizabeth, can you close with us for this uh, answer um, before we go to the Q&A? Yes, sure. What needs to be done, I would say, is that humanity needs to stop ignoring the connections that exist between these issues, the issues of race, the issues of climate justice, the issues of the environment, and recognize the people that are the most affected in the crisis and realize that we cannot be able to address the climate crisis without the people that are at the center of these challenges. And we cannot say that we are connected in the same planet, yes, and refuse to recognize the injustices that exist in the world and refuse to recognize the fact that there is still no much of diversity when it comes to how we address the challenges. And so every time that I envision a world where humanity is going to live in harmony with nature, I also envision a world where the people that are the most vulnerable will not have to bear the brunt of the impact of the climate crisis on their own and that the people that are the most responsible will begin to take responsibility and begin to act responsibly and even own up the problems and begin to support the most vulnerable communities because at the end of the day we have been ignoring the whole aspect of loss and damage people are dying people are suffering from the crisis and we cannot continue to assume that this is not happening, but we can open up our eyes and begin to support these people to adapt to their impacts because they are already supporting themselves. Communities out there are every day working on solutions to build their own resilience, solutions to adapt to the impacts of the climate crisis. And the only thing we can do as the world is to begin to be in solidarity with these communities. And that is the only way we are going to be of great help and by that we will also be tackling the climate crisis and at the end of the day it's about putting people and our planet above profits and when we talk about people it is about the people that are less represented as well it is also about the people that are from marginalized communities it is about everyone and recognizing the inequalities and the differences that we all have right now and then begin to address our problems and challenges from the root causes thank you yeah, lovely. I really appreciate that. And I think it's a beautiful way to end. And also for people to understand that like um, the poet June Jordan used to say, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So now we're going to go to the questions. And I thank everyone for participating. And please, uh, if you feel like um, you would like to ask a question, please do so. Um, the first question is from Angelina. Um, brilliant analysis, um, but the, uh, um, she's got a statement at the beginning first, sorry. 
I agree with you fully and was wondering if you could also share your thoughts on the economic system and how that plays into the topic. Much of food processed in the global uh, south or developing countries is exported to the north or developed world. Uh, people from the developing world are not ex are not only exploited from ec an economic point of view, but also environmentally, yet they depend on this relationship and have no chance or choice to fight this injustice. Um, is there, there are labels like fair trade for better consciousness, but is it enough in your opinion? Do we not have to cut consumption um, by by the means in the global north. We do a, a sort of round table. So Elizabeth, you start. I think you're still muted. Sorry, thank you. I think I totally agree that there is more to the challenges that are happening beyond the economic bit of it and also an environment. And just to also highlight some also good examples of what is happening, for example, we are seeing the conversations around the internal combustion engine in the climate crisis conversations. And car imports from the West are just undermining Africa's ability to leapfrog. And we've also had instances in the, in the past where it's like the global South is more of trying to be turned into a dump site or a dump site where the waste from the West will be dumped to Africa, for example. And there was that conversation, especially on plastic waste in my own country, Kenya, where we already have a ban on plastic bags, the use and production and manufacture of plastic bags in place. And so what this means is that it is definitely the fact that we have just chosen to ignore these aspects because no one would even try such an instance of trading in a country that has already banned the use, manufacturing, production of plastic waste, but then they, they are to be important in my country. So I see this as an aspect of the fact that the African people as well are beginning to also become resilient about these issues and beginning to understand that we can also at some point be able to handle our own problems and our own challenges. And this is being really clearly demonstrated by the communities themselves who are every day resilient from the challenges. It's about the challenges, yes, but it's also about what we can do as a community of the African people to be able to adapt to these problems. And we have seen even from the community projects like the Great Green Wall, where African people are going to stop a desert by planting so many trees in, in the Sahel region. And I think if we recognize these aspects and begin to see Africa for the solutions that Africa has and begin to see Africa as a solution to these challenges and not as a problem, then at the end of the day, that is where we begin to see change. Because I feel the world still views Africa for the problems. That is why you will just see stories about poverty or hunger, photos of bad things that happen to Africa, but where are the stories of resilience, the stories of communities that are every day working on solutions that we talk about every day in the boardrooms because we are not trying to invent any new solutions. All of the solutions we talk about in these conversations, the people in the global south, for example, are already working on them. Every nature-based solutions we talk about every day, it's written, but communities who don't even have access to the science and data are working on them every day. But where are the real African climate stories of people that are working on these solutions every day? We have really not given Africa, you know, we, we don't have the right stories from Africa, maybe yeah. because that is what we choose to report, but we need to begin amplifying the right African stories of resilience and of people who are every day working on these solutions. Yeah, it has a lot to do with who's in charge of the narrative and, and you know, we have a lot and, and that that in, implies and, and, and reinforces um, you know, positionings and aspects that mean that um, a particular narrative is maintained about a particular group of people and a particular geography. And that is something that is not, um, you know, as it, when it compounds, it's very difficult to, for people to move away from it. 
and because we don't have enough counterbalance on the other side and you know media and and information to actually present those um, aspects we really are at a loss to compete within that when that within that space alas do you have um uh, anything to add on the <clears throat> on this uh, subject or? um i think if we look into the economical drive of the problems that we have um, all been discussing tonight, I think that we cannot actually neglect the fact that behind all of this, one of the driving factors is actually the economic system, the global economic system behind this, which is neoliberalism, which actually favors a form of openness and a very cruel form of openness to markets that countries that are not necessarily equipped have to expose themselves to. And I think the global waste trade is a very good example, actually. And Elizabeth, you earlier mentioned um, being dumping grounds for environmental uh, hazardous waste. And this is actually happening to some countries. And I think um, that, again, we have to think problems together. Like, why is this actually happening? What is at the root of the problem? And how can we actually tackle this? And um, coming back to the question that has been asked, mm. Again, I would say that we need to create a new narrative with a wider perspective that actually allows to see what are the causes and what is creating this mess that we are in. Yeah, well, it's true. I mean, it, it, all of it is, needs a rethink. Um, next question is about uh, the Belt and Road Initiative of China. To what extent should it be considered as a serious alternative to how international organizations have historically handled aid to save the environment. Anybody want to jump in? <laughs> I can come in on this point and then very happy to hear what others have to say. Um, I think that uh, um, China is, China's launched an initiative for of South-South cooperation between, it considers itself to still be a developing country, whereas a lot of countries would consider it to be an emerging economy. And as such, China has set up this South-South cooperation, um, which uh, within that includes this um, Belt and Road Initiative. Um, I would say that there's a need to be cautious with this initiative. Um, because a lot of the, the financing within this initiative is around infrastructure finance. Um, infrastructure finance is of course very necessary. We have a growing global population and uh, we have a growing population um, that is moving to urban centers. And as such, you will need infrastructure within, within urban environments, but also to connect urban environments to rural environments. However, there is a, the, a lot of infrastructure is not necessarily aligned with environmental and uh, climate safeguards, nor do these types of projects take into account um, uh, issues around uh, debt or issues around um, workers' rights and, and social labour aspects. Um, sometimes this is because these projects are funded by public-private partnerships, PPPs, and um, in, in the cases of those sorts of projects, um, research shows that a lot of the time it can be costlier um, to uh, invest, to use um, uh, public-private partnerships or indeed private finance, which in turn um, means that the, the country involved in the partnership incurs more debt um, and so that debt then gets passed on to uh, the citizens as well um, through things like taxes or inflation, et cetera. Um, additionally, some of these um, infrastructure projects are in fossil fuels infrastructure. Um, and as we know, fossil fuels are the, the single greatest contributor to um, uh, emissions. Uh, and so there is a need for an, any of the projects within the Belt and Road Initiative to be coherent with um, other international agreements such as the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. So I would be cautious about this type of, of project and I wouldn't necessarily uh, say that it is a, um, 
is a solution or 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 or, or good um, development approach to sustainable development. Yeah, I think that it also means that it ultimately puts Africa as a continent with the youngest population and one of the lightest footprints in a position where they're trapped in moribund systems of energy um, and not having access to uh, sustainable um, energy forms and so that they're, they're their assets become trapped in a way. Um, and again, it becomes an extraction of resources process rather than um, a way for the continent to um, really benefit from its resource, but also um, innovate. And that's something that the investment in, in that frame is not set up to do, in fact. It's not set up for Africa to innovate um, in relation to its own resources, whether they be material or uh, intellectual um, or cultural. Um, Elizabeth, did I see you wanted to step into that? I think I just wanted to give a practical example of how that is already affecting my own country. And as we speak, we are running a campaign to save and protect our own green spaces in Nairobi City, which is the capital of Kenya. And what we are seeing is that PPP, the public-private partnership with the government to construct an expressway that is definitely not going to benefit the, the minority, the, the majority of the Kenyan citizens, but it's meant to benefit the minority of people who probably drive to the airport and back home and it's it's really right now we have seen a massive uh, destruction and felling of trees in Nairobi city and we cannot talk about addressing the climate crisis without looking into our cities for greener solutions and, and without looking into our cities even towards the green recovery and so for us we see this is definitely going to affect uh, so many things because it's we're destroying nature and putting up the roads and and for me i think the path of development that africa should be following we should get it right and we should not follow the same path that really got us into this mess for instance and there is an opportunity to do that if we begin to get things right if we begin to invest sustainably because at the end of the day it's going to be more debts and loans incurred on us and the next generations, but it's being done at the expense of our environment, at the expense of our people. And we were trying to argue with facts that about 70% of the citizens uh, either use public transportation or they walk. So, and this expressway is going to just benefit the few percentage of people that need to use the road to the airport. And at the end of the day, will be left with the concrete jungle and we are going to be facing the the, the 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 greatest challenges that cities are facing from climate change and we are saying that as young people we cannot afford to take a greater risk and this is among some of the things that we are trying to fight against because it is not fair for our generation it's not fair for my generation because we will have to live longer with the consequences and even bear the biggest burden of solving these challenges in the future, which is not right. And I think this is something that like Leah, you've mentioned that uh, nations need to begin really being careful about because at the end of the day, for instance, the Kenyan Express, I think it's going to be on a 30 years under China where people will pay toll fees to use the road, but it will have left a massive destruction of nature in the city. And the city does not have as much tree cover yet. I've just already mentioned that the entire country has about 7.3% of the forest cover. We've already had to face massive deforestation from the before the industrial times. And right now there's already massive deforestation. And instead of taking the time to regenerate nature, then all of these things are coming in. There's the foreign direct investments and the PPP partnerships that are messing up with our planet. And I think 
we need to also begin getting it right also in, in terms of the leadership and the people that are making decisions for Africa as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, we, we're, we're, our time is draining away from us, but I've, I'm going to try and get a couple more questions in. Um, one question, which I think we talked about, but I would like for you to you all to kind of respond to it. And the question is, how do we redistribute power? Given the firm hold white led environmental organizations have in controlling the dialogue and money for climate change actions, what can be done to shift that power to being more equitable in every arena? Now, I'll preface it by saying, you know, we're not the ones that you should be asking the question to. <laughs> I mean, I appreciate it, and I understand why the question's asked, but this is, as um, Alas pointed out in the beginning of her presentation, I, we, it's not a question of not wanting to collaborate, but it's also time for us to actually connect with the people that this question actually relates to. Um, but please, you know, that that's that's I took a little bit of a liberty as a moderator to <laughs> state my opinion. <laughs> so whoever wants to jump in, please. If I may. Yes. By all um, means. I absolutely agree with what you said. I mean, what we see is and also the question I can only agree because um the people that are now in power and the people that decide the fate of um, the world and how the world is structured, it does not take into account actually the perspective of the people that suffer the most. I mean, I think on this we all agree, but then what could be avenues for change? I mean, radically speaking, we all get up tomorrow and abolish this system. And I mean, but this will not happen. And then after this, we have day one after the resolution, revolution and we have to find another system <laughs> yeah. to organize ourselves in. But I think the continuous speaking up and the continuous f taking space actually, which very often is grassroot led, this kind of pushes the agenda and makes people force to actually listen. And I think that actually what civil society actors are doing, what activists are doing, I think this has already taken us so far that at some point there is a critical mass which is building up, which just cannot be ignored. So I would say uh, that an answer to this is, of course, also trying to get into position of powers to try to influence the system already, but also to just mobilize and create a critical mass. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that this is always the challenge in, um, in this in this process of of examining and, and discussing climate change because it it has so many layers that people aren't actually talking about. I mean, everyone's talking about emissions. The average human does not understand what that means. And it needs to stop. <laughs> I mean, you need to talk with people in relation to this issue with respect to the things that actually are affecting them, or take the time to explain to them that this, this procedure, this structure is actually like, in my opinion, a kind of bait and switch. You know, it's, it's about sending something, start something uh, that starts in the north, gets relabeled, gets sent to the south, and stays there. Especially if it's something that's, um, you know, destructive, quite frankly. Um, anyone else want to come in on that? Just to quickly come in to um, uh, add to what Alas has already said, um, it's it is very much about listening to local communities, but first reaching out to them and understanding what their needs are. Um, and I, I think a lot of these uh, global environmental organizations, they tend to be based in the, the global north. They're meant to be international organizations, but they're 
overwhelmingly headquartered in the, the global north. I know that some, some of these institutions have made efforts to relocate their headquarters to the, the global uh, south um, in order to ensure that there is um, better uptake of the voices of those who are most impacted. However, even if that happened, the, the sort of strategic direction of an organization will, will still remain in the, the global north. Um, there needs to be more of a consciousness to reflect upon the need to draw in people from the, the global south. I attend a lot of advocacy and policy meetings where people say we need to tackle climate impacts because it's not fair that this is happening to people in the global south. But the people around the table haven't thought to themselves to invite anyone from the global south. This mentality needs to, to change. Um, and I think it starts by people of color just raising the point every time they are invited to a meeting. What about these impacted communities? In, in Belgium has a lot of environmental organizations, but I wonder how many of them work actively to invite people from Mullenbeck in Brussels, which is a part of the city that, um, that has been documented as having very high emissions and is close to industrial areas. So it's in a hot spot zone for things like air pollution. This is something that some of the, the um, communities, the, the Roma community has raised within European Parliament. Very grateful to them for doing that. But it was raised once and then it was forgotten. So a much more conscious effort needs to be taken to draw in the voices of, of impacted communities whilst recognizing that they are survivors essentially. They've had to go through this for decades and they're still surviving and they're still fighting back. Drawing them in as defenseless victims is offensive and mm. it lacks respect. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I really appreciate that. And I think that's correct. I mean, it's the kind of uh, thing that my friend Bonnie Greer calls crisis competency. Elizabeth, you have the last word, my dear. Thank you. I will just add that as we have all had and we see from the things that we either read or watch in the news, for example, of this crisis is that the climate crisis definitely affects everyone. Environmental challenges affect everyone, but not equally. And I think the thing would be we cannot address any of these challenges without reflecting on the views and the challenges that are being faced by these people on the ground. And it's just an example of how any community developer would do. For example, if I need a certain community in my country to have access to water, I will not go there and just put up a water tank and then leave. It's not going to benefit them at the end of the day because I have not involved them in understanding if this is what they really need right now. And if I put it there, it's going to benefit them at the end of the day. So I think one of the biggest failure that the world is doing is to begin thinking that we are acting on solutions by excluding the people that are at the center of these challenges. And I think the only time we will begin to get it right is when we begin to put these people at the center and listen to their stories, listen to their stories of resilience, their challenges that they face every day, and the kind of solutions that they are trying to do every day and then focus on empowering them because they are not just sitting there and waiting for people to begin taking solutions. They are not just folding their hands and, and struggling. And I'll give a good example. The women, for example, in the dry areas, and I'll give an example with the Northern Kenya, for example, in Kenya, who lack access to water, they don't just sit there. They have to walk about 12 miles every day to search for water and food for their families. So they are not just waiting, they are struggling and trying to be resilient to deal with the challenges at their own capacities. 
and the best gift that the world can give to the next generation and to these people that are at the center is to begin listening to their stories, understanding their challenges. And then that is where we begin to implement the solutions from the level of these local communities and these people that we are calling vulnerable or marginalized groups. And then we begin to tackle the solutions from their own level, from their own challenges, and buy their own stories and then begin to highlight their stories because the world needs to listen to these stories. And at the end of the day, the, all of these statistics, uh, I would say like, for example, about the emissions that you have mentioned, but where are the statistics as well of the loss and damage that is occurring as a result of the climate crisis? These issues are often underreported as well. And I think it is about time we also begin to recognize that they also need to be amplified and I think at some point, I remember, we always mentioned this, that for instance, when the Amazon rainforest is on fire, it is all over in the international news and everyone knows about it. Everyone is contributing finances to support. But when the Congo rainforest, for example, that is in Africa, which is also a very huge, uh, you know, it's a very huge uh, forest like the Amazon, for example, no one talks about it, it's just, almost no one talks about it. Just a few people, for example, in Africa or a few people who care about it that talk about it. So yeah. recognizing the inequalities and beginning to involve all of these aspects and recognizing that, yes, we are in the same storm, but we're in different boats. And then finding ways to balance out all of these issues is what is going to help us at the end of the day deal with our challenges. Yeah, that's absolutely great ending. It's really about from all aspects, you know, getting, becoming aware of and really rectifying blind spots um, wherever they may exist. And I think right now, this is a real demand of the global north that it, it's sort of what I call navel gazing now has to end because it's impacting on too many people. Um, and ultimately, we will have missed our window of opportunity by continuing to operate in this manner. Well, my people, as always, there's never enough time, but um, I know with myself, I got a wonderful education from these brilliant young women of color um, talking on the subject of climate change and the environmental movement. Um, it was really important to me that each had time to speak fully, not in sign, sound bites, not broken, not talked over, but just to be able to speak fully and openly on a subject that they know very well um, and approach from very different angles, but all converging um, into a space where um, the end desire is for social justice, for economic justice, um, and for uh, the real, true acknowledgement of human connectivity by acknowledging and respecting the, the elegance as well as the expertise of people on the ground in the Global South. Um, I would first like to um, thank the colleagues here in Bozar for this real wonderful opportunity today on Earth Day. I feel really great to have been able to do this on Earth Day. Um, um, I'd like to thank Olga Brayar and Carl Vandenbroek of Agora, Elena Aquilo and Kathleen Lowe, who first approached me about presenting the lectures at Bozar, and to Jan Wallen from Zinema, who was the best, was the B-Side's first cheerleader. I look forward to seeing you all um, at the next B-Side lecture, which will take place on the 14th of May as part of the May Days Festival um, entitled, Somebody Didn't Tell Somebody Something, The Conundrum of Colonial Monuments, where I'll be joined by Kayende Andrews, professor of sociology, um, at Birmingham City University and the founder of the Black Studies program there, and Jennifer Tosh, cultural historian and founder of the Black Heritage Tours in Amsterdam and New York. 
I would finally like to thank my wonderful collaborators this evening, Alas Mojtahed Najafi, Leia Achampong, and Elizabeth Watuti. They are truly the leaders of the new school. Thank you very much. Have a great evening, and we'll see you on the 14th of May. <laughs>